All right. And um, with that, we are, um, I'll go ahead and introduce Tommaso. So Tommaso is a, a researcher at uh, INFN in, in Padova in Italy. Um, he is uh, an experimental particle physicist um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and he's especially active in uh, statistics and machine learning uh, in, in particle physics data analysis. Uh, so he has done a long career on, on that uh, general area, starting with the CDF experiment at Fermilab and more recently with the uh, CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider at, at CERN. Um, and he's especially interested in, in, in basically statistical techniques and machine learning techniques in particle physics data analysis. Um, he has also held various leadership positions in that area. For example, he was for several years the chair of the statistics committee at the CMS experiment, uh, including in 2012 during the discovery of the Higgs boson. So he was effectively overseeing the use of statistics in the experiment during that very exciting uh, period of time. Um, after that, uh, he has also um, uh, managed uh, two separate uh, European training ne networks on uh, machine learning techniques in particle physics data analysis, uh, effectively training several PhD students uh, in, uh, in machine learning and advanced statistics in particle physics data analysis at, at CERN. Uh, he's also very active in scientific outreach. Uh, for example, a couple of years ago, he published a book called Anomaly, uh, Collider Physics and the Quest of New Phenomena at, at Fermilab, which uh, I would very much recommend you to read if you're interested in knowing how these uh, large scientific experiments uh, actually function. Um, uh, with that, um, we will go to the actual talk. So uh, uh, the talk uh, is, is called Frequent Statistics, the Particle Physicist uh, Way, uh, uh, with the subtitle, How to Claim Discovery or Rule Out Theories. Uh, with that, Tommaso, uh, please uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Michael, for this uh, uh, luxurious uh, introduction. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for uh, spending your time with me this evening, for me, or this afternoon, for you. Uh, so, yeah, this talk uh, will uh, try to give you a flavor of the kind of use of statistics that is made in particle physics experiments. And of course, we will not be able to cover uh, everything, but we'll give a look at a few interesting things. Uh, so the reason for this talk, in fact, as I see it, is that uh, uh, we particle physicists uh, uh, have the tendency of believing that like, we can do everything, okay? Not just statistics or physics. We can do everything better than anybody else. We are the first in the class, so to speak. Uh, that's, that's a general attitude, but in general, uh, uh, physicists think that they know statistics uh, enough to carry out their measurements without external help. And they have over time built an arsenal of standard methods of inference, which uh, some of which are special to the field and not of all of them, I would say, have uh, solid uh, theoretical foundations in the theory of statistics proper. So it, it looks to me fruitful to have a discussion and several discussions like this have happened in the, in the past. Uh, recently, there's a series of, uh, of uh, happenings called the Fist Stat that uh, have uh, collected the statisticians and physicists uh, to attack these questions. But in general, it's good to have a discussion to bridge the gap on the jargon and uh, on how we use the techniques because this is an evolving field so that we can uh, actually look forward to having improvements. Um, indeed, our problems are quite special, so, so this is the right audience for me to advertise uh, some of these techniques and see if we can go further. So the contents of uh, today's lecture talk, uh, call it as you like, uh, is first of all, we'll, we'll do a jargon check to, to, to be on the same page uh, with uh, the way I'll talk about things. Uh, I have sort of uh, interacted with statisticians over time, so I, I, I can sort of speak the language, but, but, but well, you should also know how physicists typically discuss these things. Uh, so we'll go through very quickly what we do in particle physics measurements in, in these big uh, giant machines, uh, particle accelerators. 
And now we partic in particular, how we search for new phenomena in, at the very small distance scales. Uh, so we search for new particles uh, and we, if we don't find them, we set upper limits on the parameters that describe their existence. So we'll discuss uh, this, Neyman's construction. I'll, I'll remind uh, how, we, how we use it at least and uh, some, some issues connected with its uh, with the use of, of these techniques uh, for our problems. And then we'll, we'll go through a brief history of uh, a criterion which is used in energy physics practice to uh, decide whether we can go out and declare that we've found a new particle or phenomenon. We have this five sigma criterion, basically a type one error rate of three times to the minus seven. And uh, we'll see how, where this was born and, uh, and because it's important to know what are the rules. And then we'll see what the trouble with this is in particular uh, on, on certain uh, aspects of it. Uh, and, uh, and, and okay, I, I think this will give uh, me a chance to give you the flavor of the kind of business we are into. So a jargon check. When we physicists say uh, determining, uh, what you really should hear is that we are saying that we estimate a parameter, okay? That we say we determine it. And when we say we estimate, uh, at least experimental physicists, uh, it's more of a, you should hear that it's more of a guess. So I estimate that uh, this nuisance parameter is in this range, it's a guess, okay? And the observable space, that's how we call it, uh, it's, it's what you call a pop population. And so when we say we observe something, uh, uh, you would say that you draw a sample. An event uh, or a data are, are, is what you in fact call a sample. And when we talk about uncertainty, we are not talking about uh, 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 our near future in this world, <laughs> but we talk about uh, really what, what you would call the error on the estimate of a perimeter, for instance, okay? So we talk about the systematic and statistical uncertainty. But when we talk about error, un unless we are talking about type one error rate or uh, mean squared error, we really mean that we have made a mistake. And <laughs> systematic uncertainty for us is what you would call a nuisance parameter, okay? So this is, this is something that we should keep in mind when we have to discuss uh, among physicists and statisticians. So the goal today is to talk about particle physics measurements and searches. And uh, so I, I, I think I need to give you a crash course in that and see if I, if I let's see if I can make that uh, um, uh, in a reasonable amount of time. So we have a, ma a model which is actually a full-blown theory, a pretty good theory, I would say, that allows us to compute through, uh, through the basic fundamentals of, of the theory of particles, uh, particle fields, uh, the result of subatomic processes with high precision. So we collide particles and we know what comes out. We know the probabilities, okay? And by doing these experiments uh, through the last 50 years, we have discovered that, that matter at, the, at, the, at its in, innermost uh, scale, it, it's made of quarks that are constituents of protons and neutrons that make up nuclei of, of, of atoms. And there are three quarks uh, in each proton and neutron. In fact, it's not just three, it's a, it's a sea of these particles that uh, come into existence and disappear. And there, there are three families of leptons, this, this down here, to which the electron belongs. So the electron, as we know, it is a constituent of matter, but there are other fancy particles that behave similarly to the electron, and also neutrinos that are part of this lepton family. And then there are interactions, force carriers are, are mediate, forces are mediated by the exchange of gluons that are keeping the nuclei together, by the photon that gives us the electromagnetic uh, interaction, and uh, W and Z bosons that are important for fusion processes inside stars. And then there is one other particle that is called the X boson, which was predicted over 50 years ago, now 50, uh, yeah, in 1964, so uh, 56 years ago now, and uh, was discovered in 2012 by the Large Hadron Collider. So this is this, the picture, okay? 
And in fact, we have this large machine, which is a 27 kilometer long tunnel that is built 100 meters underground uh, near Geneva in Switzerland, uh, which is instrumented along the ring by four uh, large experiments. You see, these are humans on the scale. Uh, that allowed to take snapshots of the proton collisions that happen at their interior uh, 40 million times per second, okay? So these are gigantic endeavors. Uh, the, here are a few pictures of, of uh, the CMS experiment uh, to which I belong. It's a 3,000 strong collaboration that built this uh, experiment and operates it. I argue that it's arguably, yeah, one of the most complex machines ever built by humankind. Uh, hundreds of millions of collisions take place every second, and uh, each of them produces signals in tens of millions of electronic channels. We read them in, we pattern recognize uh, the important features of the event, we store them, and we analyze them and do inference. How do we detect the particles, and there's thousands that come up uh, out of these collisions every, every, every 40, 40, million, 40 million times a second? So, uh, the particles that have electric charge are bent by a very strong magnet, so they create uh, curved paths. Uh, and then, and by measuring how curved the path is, we know the energy of these particles. And then particles are destroyed by interacting with dense layers of material in what we call calorimeters, so that we measure the energy also of particles that are neutral and didn't leave a track in the inner tracker, which is made of silicon sensors. And then there are muons that uh, are these uh, heavier brothers of the electrons that can actually travel outside of these uh, dense layers of material and get uh, detected outside. So we reconstruct their tracks. So we determine the species of particles and we determine their four momenta, their, their direction and energy. And this allows us to construct high level features that tell us what really was it that uh, the collision produced. So, we have uh, a reconstruction of the event, and then we have these fancy event displays that allow us to picture the amount of energy that flows in various directions. And here you see the tracks reconstructed of two muons, for instance, in uh, the decay of, uh, of a heavy Z boson in this case. And then we do a, a huge dimensionality reduction. Well, there was already a large dimensionality reduction that brought from 10 million channels to maybe 100 uh, variables that describe the event. So there is a muon and it has this energy in this direction. There is a jet of particles with this other energy and so on. And then uh, we create another dimensionality reduction step that allows us to plot on a single dimensional histogram, for instance, the reconstructed mass that e each observed event uh, uh, features if it gave rise to the production of a certain particle. So a particle has a def definite mass, and so it, all the events that were, in fact, the decay of this particular particle will pile up uh, e with a Cauchy distribution uh, at a certain mass value in the reconstructed mass distribution, while the background will have some uh, more smooth shape, so that by finding peaks in this distribution, we identify particles. We are spectroscopists as we were 100 years ago, we still look for lines in the spectrum. Only the lines are not so sharp. They are a little bit blurred by the experimental res resolution. So what do we do with this? We have a theory, the standard model. It allows us to calculate predicted probabilities for the physics processes to extreme accuracy. We believe that the standard model is it's great, but it's incomplete. And uh, we want to see what's, what's behind it, okay? So we look for new physics processes, other particles that may lie beyond that higher energy that we have not investigated in previous machines. So we look for particles, new force carriers. And we also measure with extreme precision processes that are known, these probabilities that by colliding a proton, I get a Higgs boson. I want to measure it as well as I can because this will allow me to test the theory. So we make extensive use of hypothesis testing and point of and interval estimation. We also do a number of other things. Uh, so we need unfolding techniques. Uh, we do dimensionality reduction, so we do classification and regression using machine learning tools. 
to do a number of things which we have no time to investigate today. So for a new particle search, we use these funny Feynman diagrams, they're called, that describe what goes on at the subnuclear level. So you have a proton coming in, another proton coming in, they exchange particles, they create a Higgs boson, and then this particle will decay and produce two photons that I can actually measure in my apparatus. So we have Monte Carlo generators that take in the, 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 the theory and uh, uh, they can be plugged into uh, simulations and then we get artificial data that, uh, that describe what we should see if we see a signal of the Higgs boson decay. And then we select the data and uh, we try to evidence the particle by creating, say, a histogram of the mass of the observed events where if there is an accumulation at a certain mass, uh, once we subtract the background, we can see that there was a signal, okay? So this is basically, uh, well, not 100%, but uh, I would say more than 50% of what we do, okay? We do a test of hypothesis, which allows us to der derive the probability that we saw this data, given the fact that I may say there is only background, okay? So this might be a fluctuation. And if the probability of a fluctuation, well, the probability of the data given only a background model, if this is very, very small, below 310 to the minus seven, we claim that we have discovered a new process, okay? We, do, we will discuss this more in detail later. If there is no signal, we can rule out theories. How do we do that? Well, if uh, there is a distinct theory that says there is a new particle with a certain mass, we go, we don't find it, we say the model is wrong. But more often, the model is composite, so there is a nuisance parameter. In fact, the mass of the particle is not known beforehand. So we investigate a range of possible values of the, of the mass, and, uh, and, uh, and, and we can do inference in every point of the mass and say, uh, well, I, saw, I can limit the rate of uh, this process to a certain value because I didn't see more than say 100 such decays. If there were more than 100 such particles in the data set, I would have seen an excess. But I didn't, so I have an upper limit uh, on the signal rate. And then I compare this limit to a theoretical curve, uh, which says that uh, it is more likely that we produce many particles if they have a small mass, and it is more likely that we produce few particles if they have a large mass. And this is basically due to the fact that uh, higher energy processes are less likely to take place in our collisions. And so we can say, okay, I, I set a limit here. So what this means is that I can exclude all values of mass below this value. So this tells me the model may be still good, but at least I can chunk off a parameter space uh, part that tells if the theory is right, that this particle must be, must be heavier. And this is important input, and it allows us to publish our results and uh, get citations, okay? In fact, we do most of that. We, this is, uh, you cannot read this graph, uh, and uh, I, I don't want you to read this graph, but if you did, you would see that in fact, uh, each investigated model has a range of exclusion where it, the model was tested and was not uh, proven correct. So uh, this is generally the business that we do in, in particle physics uh, experiments. We rule out theories uh, as a function of the theory parameters, okay? So how we do it is by using uh, deriving confidence intervals. And so there's, there's a, an old fashioned way to do that. We have better ways, well, better, I wouldn't say better, different ways to do it. But let's give a look at what Neyman's construction is because it's relevant for a couple of points I'll make later. So, you know, we specify a model which provides a probability density function that a particular observable is, uh, is seen given a certain value of the relevant parameter of interest mu. And of course, we specify a type one error rate. Uh, and then for each value of the true value of the parameter, we draw a horizontal acceptance interval in a two dimensional graph such that uh, the probability that uh, if mu has a certain value, I will find X in a certain range is given by one minus alpha. 
So I have to des decide how to uh, order the values of, uh, of, uh, of x that I am integrating on. So typically I will construct central intervals such that they cut half of uh, the type one error rate on each of the sides of this. And this will create two curves of mu versus x. And once we do that, uh, and we actually perform the measurement and find the value of x, we can uh, construct a vertical line and cut away and see the values of mu which are compatible with the observed x. So I can extract an interval for mu. But in some cases, I will not be sensitive to specific values of mu, and I can only derive upper limits. So to derive upper limits, I will have a curve, only one curve, uh, which is derived by integrating these PDFs horizontally from x to infinity, and then I get this curve. Okay, anyways, this uh, is Neyman's recipe, and it guarantees frequentist coverage. Coverage is very important for particle physicists because we want to uh, have a way to uh, uh, correct, to, to, to be sure of what we are talking about in terms of the probability of, an, of a phenomenon. Since, uh, since we are measuring uh, uh, physical constants of nature, uh, which we believe have a defined value, although we don't know what it is, we can hardly speak of the probability of, uh, of a physical constant to have a certain value, although we don't know what that is. So we tend to be doing our business in frequentist way, so we tend to like coverage as an important property of our measurements, okay? And we also try to avoid subjective inputs in our, in our uh, measurements because we t try to picture the way really nature works and this should be objective. So this has led to preference of classical over Bayesian techniques over time. It's true that we do fancy a flutter now and then. In fact, this is, this is a, a 2006 article which describes a bet which I cast on my blog 14 years ago and then later won against a couple of uh, folks. Uh, about, and that shows that we have priors. In fact, I didn't believe that we would find new physics signatures at the LHC and I, and I put my money where my mouth was and I did win something. But, but in, in any case, uh, Bayesian techniques uh, are used in particle physics, but uh, they're not as used as classical ones. Coverage is important, but we sometimes disregard it. I will, uh, I will take a chance to, to show you a graph that was very important when the X boson was sought for in an, a, an experiment prior to the LHC, which eventually discovered it. Here in black, you see that the model that included the X boson would uh, predict that there would be a, a little bit of events uh, at the high end of this mass distribution. And the fact that they have observed a few events in this region uh, led to them claiming that they had a three sigma evidence for, for this particle. But I'm taking this graph, uh, uh, we will discuss more about the X discovery later, but I will take this graph only to show that these people in the 90s, uh, well, this was 2001, I think, they still plotted these data points with uncertainty bars. So this means that you're doing two different things. You're saying how many events you measure at a certain mass value, and you're saying what your estimate for the uh, maximum likelihood estimate of, of the rate uh, uh, in that beam is, and then you attach a vertical bar to the 68.3 percentile uh, range uh, of variation of that uh, maximum likelihood estimate. So, but if you do that, you immediately recognize here that uh, they are doing one plus or minus square root of one or three times plus or minus square root of three. So they are taking the variance of the Poisson, which is the distribution these data are drawn from, but then they, they disregard the fact that for low event counts so that uh, you cannot plot 68.3 intervals that way. Uh, so the Gaussian approximation for the Poisson breaks down quite miserably in low energy regime, in low events regime. In fact, nowadays, this is a graph of the X boson peak found by Atlas uh, at 125 GV. You see the signal is in green, in blue here. And you see that the, the error bars have become asymmetric and they do cover 
uh, as, at the required 68.3% confidence level because they are extracted by inverting uh, the, the, the Poisson hypothesis. And this was done by Garwood in 1950 for the first time. So that was just uh, a note. But uh, the name and construction and the related techniques uh, are uh, somehow problematic in a, in, a, in a kind of application that we usually, uh, that, that, we, are in, that we, we, we care about. And this is uh, when the parameter we are interested in is bounded. So if it is positive defined, uh, and then we can examine this problem by taking a, a normal distribution of our observable, so a Gaussian distributed measurement, and you immediately realize that Neyman's construction for this paradigmatic problem gives you upper limits at 5% uh, uh, type 1 error rate that are mu less than x plus 1.64. This is this vertical, this diagonal line. And this means that uh, if you find x equals minus 2, which you can uh, because uh, you have a Gaussian resolution, you uh, are returned with an empty set. You don't know what to do in this case, okay? So this is known uh, by physicists, what do you do when you know you are in the wrong 5%? So it can be fixed, but there is no general agreement on how to deal with it. In fact, uh, several fixes are being proposed. There's Bayesians that have their own solutions. There, there's, uh, there's even a, a loss of confidence uh, uh, curve that says if you really measure very negative values, that means that your measurement is bogus and you should increase your upper limit. So this is an active, uh, somewhat uh, still active area of, uh, of uh, investigations on what to do. And I will even add that, uh, that, uh, uh, that the pro procedure of Neyman, uh, when you fix uh, this uh, upper limit uh, at, uh, at with uh, saying that you put at zero the upper limit if uh, you get negative, uh, very negative X values, um, it covers, but you can devise a betting strategy against it uh, at nominal odds, uh, so 5%, so 19 to one, and be guaranteed to win in the long run. And this shouldn't happen, right? But you just choose a real constant, k, and you bet that the interval doesn't cover when x is less than k, and you pass. Otherwise, you don't bet. So you realize that if you can devise a betting strategy against a perfectly covering uh, uh, interval, there is something wrong going on. And in fact, it has to do with the theory of relevant subsets. And there is a paper that uh, discusses this by a physicist, Bob Cousins. Uh, this is, has to do with, uh, with uh, this has been investigated by Cox, of course, also. And then, in fact, Cox devised a, a, a Gedanken experiment with uh, two scales, and you have to decide which scale to use to measure your weight based on the outcome of, it, of uh, the flipping of a coin. One of the scale is more sensitive and uh, how do you define uh, the uncertainty on the weight? So uh, I will leave this uh, here, but, uh, but uh, this is interesting, I think. And uh, it's, it highlights the fact that there are still some subtleties not completely solved in this area. And there is another thing called flip-flopping uh, that uh, has to do with the fact that we don't decide beforehand whether we will claim a discovery of a new particle or put an upper limit on some parameter before actually getting the data. And typically this results in, in this awkward phrase in our papers, since we observe no significant signal, we proceed to derive upper limit. Ha, huh, then it means you are flip-flopping. So suppose that we take again this paradigmatic Gaussian resolution measurement and uh, uh, fixed uh, with this uh, max uh, x uh, or zero at the ne very negative value of the x, say that uh, if we find uh, a very large signal, uh, then we put uh, an interval around mu, while if we find x much smaller, we, 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 we put an upper limit. This property, this has the, uh, the unfortunate result that the technique undercovers, because if you construct the, 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 the confidence belt this way, you will find, and, and above a certain value, you claim discovery and you set an interval over the measured value of mu, uh, but below it, you only set an upper limit based on Eman's construction, then you have a re range of true values of mu for which you are undercovering. 
Okay, and this is actually an issue. So we have corrected our papers. We don't say any longer, since we don't observe a signal, we put an upper limit, but we still do it. Okay, so it's kind of awkward still. Okay, um, you certainly know what's the definition of statistical significance. Uh, it's based on integrating the tail of a Gaussian distribution. And uh, this uh, allows us to convert uh, uh, probabilities, p-values, into, 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 into number of, uh, of sigmas, okay? And uh, we particularly like this number, 310 to the minus 7, which is 5 sigma. And uh, this construction uh, uh, is a, for a one-tailed Gaussian distribution. We are only interested in excess of events. Typically, a new process will give us an excess of events. So we look in only one direction. Not always, but typically, yes. And the conversion, of course, uh, is just a mathematical map, uh, which allows us to talk more freely about the small numbers. Uh, of course, we have to compute p-values correctly. Uh, otherwise, our number of sigmas will be meaningless. Very quickly, we become meaningless, because very small p-values are very hard to estimate correctly. And I will show how the tails of our systematics are non-Gaussian later on in the talk. So I'm a little bit behind with time. So I will briefly talk about uh, the birth of the Five Sigma criterion. This is a physicist at Berkeley that uh, uh, realized in 1968 that uh, physicists were looking for new particles by looking in many boxes, okay? I, let's put it this way. They were looking for many, many histograms and uh, they were, the problem was that there could be exotic particles that were not made of three quarks or quark anti quark pairs as the model predicted. These are called SU3 multiplets. And so people were out looking for these particles and produced lots of papers claiming for discovery of particles that were not there just because they were doing multiple testing. So he pointed his finger at large trials factor and, uh, and actually this allowed him to estimate uh, the number of fake spurious effects that were published every year. This was done by using this kind of detectors that are called bubble chambers, but I won't uh, describe what they are, but you can see that they, the, the particles leave track in a, in, a, in, in a gas and then they can be tracked and you can compute mass of, of particle pairs or triplets and then produce histograms. So he pictured the situation which required some mending. And so he said, to the theorist of phenomenology, the moral is simple. Wait for nearly five sigma effects, because he estimated that this would cut all of these spurious effects. But for the experimental group who has spent a year of their time and perhaps a million dollars, the problem is harder. You want to publish, but they should realize that any bump less than about five sigma calls for a repeat of the experiment. So what Five Sigma does for you is that uh, reduces these uh, spurious claims. Uh, in physics, uh, we call this look elsewhere effect. That is, uh, we have a multiplicity of possible searches because we have a nuisance parameter. So the mass, for instance, is not defined. So we look in many, many possible mass values. And then, of course, uh, there are ill-modeled or, or non-Gaussian systematic uncertainties that, uh, that uh, can uh, sort of mess up uh, our estimation of, this, of, of, the, of, the, of the significance. And so uh, protection from trials factors and unknown or ill-modeled systematics was the rationale behind the Five Sigma criterion. You know better than me that this criteria has no basis in professional statistics literature, no more than the 5% that is used in medicine. Uh, very quickly, because I, I have little time, uh, I will just walk you through the most important discoveries that were made in high energy physics that uh, slowly coalesced the, this idea that we should wait for uh, large uh, effects. But it took a while. Because in 1974, quarks were uh, discovered by finding this particle close, called the J-Psi. It caused the five Nobel Prizes. And this is the peak that was seen. You see, there is no question of significance when you see such a towering effect. And the tau lepton was also uh, not a question of statistics analysis, whether these uh, funny events found at Slack were a new lepton or not. 
And then uh, a spurious uh, signal was observed when looking for a causing of this particle made by a heavy quark called the bottom quark that was uh, later discovered by the same experiment. But here they published this effect uh, and uh, it was due to their multiple testing in a wide range of histograms. Uh, and uh, they did account for a trials factor in their estimate, but they published something which uh, could have uh, an error rate of 2%. So it was not a very significant effect. They published it and then they retracted it and they studied the matter much, much, much in more detail. And when they eventually found the particle, this is a background subtracted plot where you see a very towering peak, they waited a lot before actually getting to publish. So that was a failed application of the five sigma criterion that was still in the making. And uh, also when Rubia discovered W and Z bosons at CERN in 1983, there was uh, no statistical analysis. It was just uh, uh, proving that there were these funny events that could have no, no way to arise out other than if these particles were the cause. So we really, we had to wait 1994 for a duty, duly application of the five sigma uh, requirement because the experiment I was in, CDF, found a signal of top quark. This is the reconstructed mass of the top quark found in 1994 by CDF where backgrounds would have uh, accounted for only this small histogram here. They had a counting excess of three sigma, but they also had a, a systematic effect on in the mass distribution. But they decided to call it evidence for top quark production in their paper. So they, one year later, more data collected. There was another experiment across the ring and the two experiments together discovered the particle by finding five sigma effects. But this cost CDF the uh, actual uh, patronymity of the discovery. Okay, so this was the first uh, particle discovered with a willful application of the five sigma criterion. So we call three sigma an evidence, but not a discovery. And following the top quark, there have been other examples. I won't go through them, but of course in 2012, uh, this was the X boson discovery that brought this five sigma criterion uh, to uh, the headlines of the press because it was widely distributed. So a reason for enforcing a small test size, three to the minus, 10 to the minus seven, is the presence of this large trials factor. Uh, it was a concern 50 years ago, but now we have computing that allows us to um, actually measure the trial factor. But still some case, sometimes it's hard to do because uh, in the X discovery, for instance, we, this, we combined in a global likelihood uh, dozens of final states, hundreds of nuisance parameters, uh, uh, funny PDFs, so, so it's not easy to compute the trials factor there. There is a study that uh, is done by physicists, uh, my friend Ayla McGross, uh, they demonstrated how to account uh, the trials factor uh, in a precise way in the business that we do. Now I don't have the time to go through it very quickly, although if, uh, if we ask for a question later, uh, I, I can describe it. Uh, the method is very quickly, very simply uh, put, uh, based on uh, constructing a maximum of a test statistic uh, uh, over the nuisance parameter, and then looking at how this uh, test statistic wiggles around as a function of the nuisance parameter, because how often it wiggles up and down a certain threshold tells you how many uh, different searches you are effectively making. And then you are, there are formulas that allow you to get a global P value from the local one. Sorry for being very quick on this, but if you are interested, I can be more exhaustive. So even if we can compute this uh, correction and then get a global uh, uh, significance, it's kind of silly to do because uh, uh, it's very well, very ill-defined. Uh, you can, of course, consider the location of this nuisance parameter to define uh, how many boxes you have looked uh, into uh, effectively. But then one might ask, well, but you have looked for particles of a certain uh, PDF, so with a certain width of their Gaussian peak. And uh, is that really fixed? No, it's not fixed, so you should take that into account. 
And this actually has been done in another paper by, by Gross and, and Vitels, but uh, it, it's beside the point. The point is that uh, there is an ill, uh, uh, Ill definition of this quantity, the, the trials factor. You could have tried different selections, cuts, uh, to put in evidence the signal, and this actually is done by physicists. So, <laughs> Uh, and uh, also you could have colleagues that search for the same particle in different ways. So when somebody goes up to the spokespersons and said, look what a signal I have found, uh, is just one in 3,000 people and uh, you should account for that too. So the bottom line is that while we can always compute the local significance, it's not always clear what the true global significance is. And then there are systematic uncertainties uh, that affect any, any physical measurement. So typically we don't know how to estimate these and uh, you can try to size them up uh, at the one sigma level and but then when you are extrapolating to five sigma you are liable to create get very bad mistakes right because if the pdf is not gaussian then you are in trouble so indeed, the potential harm of large non-Gaussian tails is argued to be why we stick to five sigma requirements even when we do not have such a large trials factor as it was the case for the single top discovery, for instance. So in any case, five sigma may not be enough in some cases. There was a study of residuals in 1975 using particle physics measurements of particle physics properties done in particle physics experiment by particle physicists. <laughs> this guy proved that particle physicists do not estimate their systematics well enough because it could get a residual plot like the one you see, which is not Gaussian, but uh, student distributed. And you know, a student distribution has large, longer tails. And in fact, if you compare to a Gaussian, by the time you hit five sigma, the ratio between such a distribution and a Gaussian is a factor of a thousand. So this tells us that we should be very, very careful, okay? Because this is published measurements and we were off in estimating our systematics. There is even a bigger meaner study of residuals done by David Bailey, which showed that this is a pathology which is common to many different areas of research where you see that the, the, the Z values, the significance uh, uh, for a normal distribution uh, would, uh, would give you residuals in this range while they extend to very, very higher values, okay? So uh, we should be very careful uh, with our systematic uncertainties or nuisance parameters as you call them. Can we solve these problems by going Bayesian, not postal? Uh, so there is one paradox called the Jeffries Lindley paradox that uh, forces us to uh, take a pause before we, 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 we start using base factors for this business. Because typically we have a null hypothesis, say the standard model on which we base a strong belief and this is a point null distribution in your jargon, right? It's uh, something uh, that is valid for a specific value of a parameter. In other sciences, it's hard to find point nulls, but for us, it's very common. The photon mass is zero. The number of protons and electrons in the universe is uh, the same, stuff like that. If we have to compare a point null to an alternative, which has a continuous support for theta, so it is uh, uh, governed by the nuisance parameter, we need to encode this in a prior belief in some way. So we will use a probability mass at theta equals theta zero for the null, and then we will distribute the rest of the probability over a range of values for theta. Well, if we do that uh, in a simple versus composite test, then we break the Bayesian uh, paradigm because we can then prove that uh, no matter how large is your evidence, that is the amount of data that you throw at the problem, the Bayesian inference that you will do strongly depends on the scale over which the prior is non-null. That is to say, uh, the paradigm that uh, the prior that you choose doesn't matter any longer when you have a strong evidence, when the data speaks loud, is not true because this uh, singularity of the, of the point null uh, uh, really uh, breaks this, okay? Indeed, the Jeffries-Lindley paradox is mentioned as uh, uh, 
as, uh, as uh, saying that frequentists and Bayesians will draw opposite conclusions on some data when comparing a point null to a composite alternative. And this arises because as uh, your data becomes more precise, you, as a, you have a certain scale for the uncertainty on the measurement, and you have a scale for the prior, which is basically a Dirac's delta, and you have a scale for the alternative prior. And so the existence of these three scales in the problem is what causes uh, um, uh, Bayesians and uh, frequentists uh, to asymptotically uh, reach opposite conclusions on, on, on this. Uh, the posterior probability that the null is true, conditional on seeing data in the critical region, that is the one that uh, would uh, exclude the null, approaches uh, certainty as the sample size becomes arbitrarily large. And this is due to the existence of these three scales in the problem. And this is a very, very common situation in high energy physics. And that is why it's kind of hard to move uh, to um, base factors uh, to decide on, uh, on a discovery level uh, or, or evidence or stuff like that. So this is an active area of research. Uh, the paradox has been used by Bayesians to criticize the way that inference is drawn by, by classical uh, statisticians. So Jeffries himself is quoted as saying, what the use of the p-value implies is that a hypothesis that may be true may be rejected because it has not predicted observable results that have not occurred. So this is a famous quote. But um, um, so base factor will retain a dependence on the scale of the prior on the alternative. There have been attempts, attempts to mend this by using uh, uh, evidence-dependent priors, but, uh, or to argue that the precise null is never true, but in particle physics, this is actually the case. So we will not resolve the issue today, but the trouble of picking the type one error rate in classical hypothesis testing is not automatically solved by moving to Bayesian territory in the case of this kind of inference. So what well, should we do? Uh, yep. in, in about five minutes. That, that oh, I'm done, I'm done. Yes, I, I'm uh, actually done. So what we should do with Phi Sigma is, uh, is that, uh, that it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, reference value, a useful standard uh, for our field. Uh, and uh, it doesn't protect uh, for uh, false claims. Uh, I have just an example for this and then I'll wrap up. So first of all, I let you see how uh, the X boson uh, data allowed us to draw inference on its existence by collecting the data just because these uh, GIFs are too good not to show them once. <laughs> you see that uh, in two different channels of X decay, the two experiments, uh, uh, found uh, these narrow, these small peaks as they collected more data. So uh, this was a, 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 a successful application of the Phi Sigma criterion because indeed uh, later on we even uh, got stronger evidence. So this is a real particle. But there was five years ago uh, a claim that the two experiments put forth so still in the diphoton final state uh, that there was a particle uh, that had a mass of 750 GeV that behaved like a X boson. And they based this on this histogram and a similar one by CMS. And this created a, a havoc because theorists jumped at this possible uh, new signal proposing a number of techniques uh, of, of, uh, of theories that could uh, allocate such a new particles. Uh, experiments tried to find more evidence. This you see is the local p-value as a function of the mass for this histogram, and you see this as a, a, a almost four sigma effect. But it was not confirmed with more data. In the meantime, though, theorists published, uh, you see as a function of time, they published almost 600 papers. I think in the end, the number is almost close to a thousand papers because this graph has continued to grow. So the point is that they put forth a huge number of possible explanations for a phenomenon that was not confirmed because it had not reached five sigma. But even if it had, I would argue that this is kind of an insane way of doing our business, right? Because you have thousands of theorists that thought for one year over Christmas and everything to find, to find an explanation for something which was not real. So 
in the process, we also learned some good physics. Uh, what we could say after having examined all these models is that, uh, so this is a joke, but uh, it was, uh, I, I argued in a conference that it seemed quicker to say what the particle could not be. And it could not be the Loch Ness Monster because it had a three bump uh, structure. And it cannot be Mickey Mouse because it had a, a non Gaussian tail. So, and, but it really it is a, a joking matter because uh, of so much effort uh, on, on a bright minds uh, on nothing, really. So the best title in the archive preprint server for a while was how the Gamma Gamma Resonance Stole Christmas, because really these guys were working over Christmas to try and explain this phenomenon, which was spurious in the end. But what it teaches us is really we need the prescription, and, but it's not, even, uh, it's not enough, because even if uh, the prescription is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is followed, because Atlas and CMS did not publish a discovery of a particle, already the showing publicly of a graph that could hint at the existence of something was a problem. So, in conclusion, physicists use profusely the technique of hypothesis testing and derive upper limits and intervals from their data. And uh, their problems are quite special, I would say. And um, uh, some, uh, some look uh, by statisticians uh, over the shoulders of physicists, uh, behind the shoulders of physicists, uh, is advisable, I think. Uh, and this has been happening, in fact. Uh, there are many debates uh, surrounding these techniques. Uh, for statisticians to work in high energy physics problem uh, uh, carries with it a large potential bonus because we publish hundreds of high citation papers. So to give you a couple of examples, there are two papers that, uh, that describe uh, this. <laughs> for instance, the feldman cousins paper that describes this way of deriving upper limits, which uh, is unified and solves the flip flopping problem is basically a rediscovery of 1.5 pages uh, in Kendall and Stewart. And it has acquired the 3,200 citation to this day. And another paper which uh, creates asymptotic formulae for likelihood ratio tests, uh, which are used uh, uh, in our uh, techniques, has collected 2,800. So my message maybe is this, come and work with us because it's fun and, uh, and there's, uh, there's a possibility to break new ground. So thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Tomasa. Uh, I even see a few hands raised here. Uh, I think Larry was probably the first. So Larry, uh, can you go ahead and ask your question? Uh, sure. Um, first of all, thanks. That was a very uh, fun talk and um, I know it's dinner time there. In <laughs> yeah. um, so the, I'm just, I was just thinking about that experiment uh, some years ago where these people claimed it turned out falsely that to discover that neutrinos could travel faster than the speed oh, yeah. of light. And I just wonder if you would comment on that and whether, did, did, I don't remember now, did they reach the five sigma threshold? Yeah, it was a six sigma effect because they had measured the, the timing of arrival of neutrinos, a bunch of them, 20 neutrinos, uh, and it was uh, six sigma away from uh, zero, which was the time of a photon, say, because uh, neutrinos travel at the speed of light and not more. So, uh, yeah, uh, this was in my talk uh, actually as uh, one of the failed applications because indeed uh, it's a very good example. They um, uh, they duly applied this and they said, we have measured the best of our possibilities, this parameter, and we say, we, we don't find any mistake and the systematics are under control and blah, 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 and this is Six Sigma. And, uh, and people didn't believe it. I mean, the physicists didn't believe it because it's just too steep of a claim to to be believed even at 310 to minus seven or, or less, uh, uh, right? Uh, I mean, it would, uh, it would really shake uh, all that we know about particle physics uh, to the roots. So what happened was that there were uh, reanalysis, further checks, uh, further data takings, and in the end, a 
systematic cause was found, which was just a loose cable which reflected the signal and caused a delay of 60 nanoseconds. 60 nanoseconds is a very small time, right? But this tells you how hard are these measurements and how careful we must be uh, when, we, when we use our data to make steep claims. So indeed, this is an example that uh, no matter how many sigma you are asking, uh, there is a degree of belief that you have to, a subjective uh, uh, belief that you have to fight when you want to convince somebody of something. So this actually calls for some Bayesian uh, flavor of, of doing this business, but that's, that's just what it is. A fixed threshold will not protect. Thank you. Yep. Okay, and I think uh, Pietro was next. Pietro, please go ahead. Uh, yes. So uh, concerning the, the, the Jeffrey Nisley paradox, so you, you, you rightly pointed out that uh, one of the points is that essentially for the point null, uh, the, the, the measure is a uh, direct delta, whereas for the alternative is a standard globe measure. So, and, uh, so basically, it's a, in, in Bayesian uh, statistics, is a problem of having uh, to treat uh, with imp uh, treating proper priors. And uh, a few years ago, I've come out some, uh, some, uh, some ways of dealing with this that involve, uh, instead of uh, using the plain, uh, the base factor, you use some score, uh, some scoring rule that <clears throat> turn out to be independent from the normalization of the prior. And uh, they would uh, kind of, uh, therefore, you basically remove the dependence on the on the number of uh, on the number of events, however, they require they, they are usually not very liked, uh, at least in, in the literature they read, because uh, they require to be calibrated uh, using an acceptance bound. So, uh, mm. we, which is usually not very liked in uh, in the Bayesian literature. But uh, since it's something that we already, uh, in particular physics physics, we already extensively do, maybe it's something that. Would uh, would uh, would agree to the would agree with the taste of the physicist to put a, to have something that I mean you have to choose an acceptance bound but uh, at least removes uh, this kind of problems and might open the way uh, to using some more Bayesian testing instead of. Okay, yeah, I'm not aware of this, uh, but the fact that uh, I'm not aware of this. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> Sorry if I sound pre presumptuous now, <laughs> but, but uh, I mean, if something doesn't take, take gain ground, uh, uh, it means that there is some, some, something in it that uh, we don't like as a practice or that uh, makes it uh, non-practicable or, uh, or, or uh, that there are other reasons to dislike it. I, I, I should look in the matter, but as you say, in the end, the field decides uh, what to use and what not, uh, also based on uh, fashion. And, uh, and so if this has not uh, caused the more, more interest in different ways of using uh, Bayesian techniques uh, for, 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 for claims or at least for setting thresholds, um, yeah, I, I, it is true that sometimes we have uh, we have uh, a lot of inertia, and uh, we should be uh, forced to accept uh, good practice to some extent. I don't know if that's the case with this uh, with this new idea that you mentioned. I I think uh, this is still out uh, out uh, for the juries is out on this. I think. 